And here we go. We we are so lucky to have with us today this evening for Moritz, Moritz Dobler, um, in Germany. Uh, and refresh my memory. Wh where exactly in Germany are you living now? I, I moved to Düsseldorf, which is okay. on the Rhine River, about five years ago. Five days ago? Years. Five years, years ago. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Um. So tell us about, you know, your experience coming to to Crossroads, um, you know, clearly a, a small school and, and maybe not that well known and um, then becoming part of the first graduating class. All right. Yeah, I, I uh, joined Crossroads in 1981. Uh, I was part of the first senior class, uh, 12 seniors. Um, I was the first AFS student at Crossroads. There were two other exchange students from Sweden. Annika and Suzanne in that class, mm -hmm. and I had not been to the United States before. Um, my experience was special in, in many ways, but one was that um, I was placed in, an, in, a, in a family that lived at Lafayette Square, which oh. is right in the middle of the city, whereas most foreign exchange students are usually in the suburbs. I think I was one of three in, in St. Louis in the urban communities of St. Louis, and the other 40 or 50 that year uh, were somewhere outside of St. Louis. And I took the bus every morning to Crossroads with my host brother, Eric. And Crossroads obviously was a small school. I think it was 170 students, very atypical of American high schools. So I was in an environment that was not uh, uh, fulfilling the American cliche. Uh, it was very different. Um, Absolutely. And then the, the Dom's family, it just seemed like such a good match for you. Right, it was. Uh, we are still very, uh, we're in touch. Um, I usually visit once or twice a year. Um, my, my host parents in St. Louis, they spend some time at Cape Cod also, um, where I visited them too. Um, I meet Allison, my host sister, regularly. I visited her in Indianapolis last year. Uh, we met in Krakow this year. Uh, I just got married about two months ago. Um, my host sister and Tom, Tom and Mary, the parents, were there. Um, so we, I think in those, what is it, 42 years since I left St. Louis, we've met at least once a year, sometimes for sometimes I spent several months in the United States. Um, so it's been a very life-changing experience. So that's true yeah. for, the, for the family, yeah. but that's also true for the school. Um, I found it, uh, I thought it was very open, very inquisitive, uh, uh, unique. Uh, we did very special things. One of the most I mean, a lot of people talk about the urban overnights, which are great, of course, mm -hmm. or were great. Uh, but I remember a class with Carmel Kalsen, American Literature, and there were three of us in that class. So we sat on the ground and debated literature. Uh, and you couldn't hide in the class, you know? And, and my no. schooling experience before that, um, if you didn't really feel like it, you could hide in the back of the room or not communicate or talk much and you'd get by, but you couldn't get by with that approach with Kamal, which was great. And I was going to ask you uh, if you remembered who was teaching it, and clearly you do. Yeah. Um, are there other teachers who, who you remember pretty clearly? Anita uh, for drama. Actually, yeah. uh, we um, did a play by Henry Gibson, Nora, and I'm going to uh, go to the theater this Saturday uh, seeing the Chipman rendition of that play that I took part in. Anita told me, uh, I played a psychiatrist in that play, and um, she told me, you're perfect. I mean, you have this slight accent. You could be Sigmund Freud. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Mike Bailey was very, uh, uh, I didn't like math much never did, um, but he was one of the very few teachers that uh, made me feel all right with math at the time. Um, those, um, yeah. well, well, tell us, you know, what you're doing now, and then we can come back to the crossroads time. All right. 
Yeah, I went, I went into journalism. Um, um, I always thought, I thought that might be uh, the career that I would choose, but then I went to business school first and I did my uh, alternative service at the time when I was that age, uh, people in Germany still, or men in Germany were still drafted. So I uh, was a conscientious objector and did an alternative service in Rotterdam and in, in the Netherlands, in the Center Against Racism. And then I didn't really know what to do. I then worked at a farm in Vermont for a while. Oh, really? <laughs> And then I started. Then I went to journalism school and started to work for a news agency, um, DPA, the German news agency, um, which was triggered by a stay in Washington, um, where I met Daryl, you, whom you interviewed recently. Right. Uh, and I interned there at the DPA news agency, and then also at a small town newspaper in Danbury, Connecticut. And that made me uh, choose the agency path. So I went to DPA, worked for DPA and then for Reuters for a while. And then I worked for a Berlin newspaper for 10 years. And then I became editor chief and editor in chief at, at a Bremen newspaper in the north of Germany. And now five years ago, I moved here. And it's been a great career for me. I mean, so is it primarily or even at all a political beat or uh... Either. Yes, okay. in, in the in the fifteen years that I spent in Berlin, uh, I was I covered the chancellery in the uh, foreign uh, office uh, for Reuters for a few, for a year or so, even for the international service, uh, the English language service, um, and that was always my the core of what I did. I did politics and and business mostly, and. That's still a focus in my work now. Like we just had election night here it was night over there was day, um, and I wrote a long editorial because that's uh, you have a uh, one issue that I really care about. Um, so, uh, can you perhaps put in the chat uh, the link to where your editorial is? Sure. It's in German now. In German, but I could get it uh, <laughs> translated thanks to Google, which didn't exist back then. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I. you may have noticed, you know, with Daryl, um, he has a book that we have a, a, an alumni uh, book and can be any kind of publications. I'd love to have, uh, you know, things that you have written. And I've written uh, four books since then, uh, and I'm putting together the little piece on that. And, and it, you know, I... The last one I wrote was uh, in 2020 about uh, the Democrats' forgotten people, how the Democrats can can um, appeal to Trump voters. And, you know, I was just thinking today, boy, it didn't work. There was did so it? much I didn't. It didn't work. And I did so much I didn't include. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't anticipate the drop in minority voting for Democrats. Mm -hmm. I didn't anticipate that women wouldn't be more for a a candidate like Kamala Harris. I'm I'm curious if you don't mind giving a uh, a synopsis of what you wrote, what that would be. Well, um, I covered. I, I wrote an editorial uh, on the debate, uh, uh, the first debate, and people were very enthusiastic on both sides of the Atlantic. And my take was, yeah, she did a good job, but would it be enough? And my feeling was, maybe not. Um, so, and I, I, I uh, uh, she attended the Munich Security Conference this year and last year, and I heard her speak there, and it was very dull. Um, mm. I mean, um, as a vice president, that may be the only way to address the public. You can't really perform. And I think her speech at the uh, convention was spectacular, but she she didn't speak enough she didn't make her points enough i think and i think it's a actually the, the it's a culture clash that we experience in the united states i think um 60 years ago um uh, uh, the racial segregation was abolished uh we've seen in the last 
decades, a spectacular move of women into senior positions in, in politics and uh, business. Um, there has been an influx of um, Latinos in the millions. And I'm not opposing that, but it changes the society, all of that. Um, We're looking even, more and more about that, absolutely. Even, even gay rights. And I think mm -hmm. uh, what we see now is the white males fight back because they're losing their ground and, and Donald Trump gives them the opportunity to feel better about themselves, to be part of the winning team. And that's not about numbers and politics. It's all about um, belonging to a group. And I think it's very dangerous, um, especially, I mean, the most dangerous scenario in my mind would have been that um, Trump is just below the majority, right. and then the unrest would start. Um, and I, well, I think this cultural clash that we see in this election night in, in the United States is something that other countries, including Germany, are experiencing as well, maybe a little bit later. But the, the, the fighting back of all the progress that has been made in the society in the past 50, 60 years they're fighting back. So it needs more explaining. It needs more, it needs to, politicians of the Democrats or similar parties here need to instill feelings more than numbers and arguments. Well, A sense of belonging is important. Are there, is there anything you think schools um, are doing to, in a sense, enable the sort of alienation among some people and resentment towards others and anything schools can do better to help us have a, a more civil uh, uh, body politics, body politic characterized by more uh, critical thinking and empathy. I mean, in my mind, the approach that the Crossroads had under your leadership would certainly help. But then again, that was in an age uh, with no social media, mm -hmm. um, um, with no cell phones, uh, and I mean, uh, I, I the first computer I ever encountered, I encountered at Crossroads. Uh, it was an Apple IIe, which was yes. state of the art at the time. Um, mm -hmm. Today you'd laugh about it, but. Um, and I think it's about the teachers in the end. Um, I think it's not about the curriculum, mm -hmm. but it's about the teachers. I think when, and that was certainly the case at Crossroads, and I see that with my son, who's 22, in his school career, um, it's always about the people you encounter, not so much about the actual curriculum. But then again, I'm not a school expert. <laughs> no, but, I, you know, I think that... Um... Teaching has become more difficult for teachers, and I think that um, the teachers who we had at Crossroads were not just teachers, they were compassionate human beings who cared about what was going on in the world and wanted to share that with students, and I think, you know, we, we were pretty successful with that. Um, right, and plus uh, the teachers that he had at the time all made an unusual choice. I mean... You had a school of only 170 students mm -hmm. um, located in a former supermarket uh, in a bad area of town, basically. So they made a choice. Yep. They Absolutely. didn't want to play it safe. They, they wanted to achieve something in teaching. And that makes a big difference. I want to go back to uh, to more of the present now, and uh, you mentioned the Munich Security Conference where Kamala Harris spoke, and um, I actually uh, read reference to that in Bob Woodward's new book called War, mm -hmm. um, and he talks about surprise that Germany um, was so committed to wanting to help out Ukraine and stand up to Russia. Is that your impression of what's happened? I would say in the beginning, yes. I mean, the war has now lasted two and a half years. I think the first year was very clearly, uh, uh, the public opinion in Germany was clearly on the side of Ukraine. 
but um, it's getting very expensive. Plus, uh, the Ukrainian refugees, um, their living costs are costly for the German government also. Um, and the times are difficult. So people ask, how long is this going to continue? How expensive is this going to be? Um, so I think the initial spark to help Ukraine um, is not as, as uh, alive anymore. A lot of people thought that this war would be over very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I did an editorial on the second day of the war, and one of the five points that I made is this war is going to take long because there, is almost, there are almost unlimited resources on both sides. Yeah. So, and that's what we see now in a way, and um, especially with the election at, uh, in the US, I think it's very unclear uh, how support for the Ukraine is going to continue because I don't think Germany and Europe are ready to fill the gap that is to be expected from Trump in supporting Ukraine. It, uh, it must be a very happy day for, for Putin. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on to what extent, if any, he may have uh, tried to manipulate the U.S. election. I'm sure he has. Um, and he has... Uh, his his cyber attacks uh, are geared to to I think pretty much all crucial ele elections now, and I I was surprised to the extent uh, uh, BBC reported that uh, there were even fake websites of newspapers that don't exist in the United States, mm. but that looked a lot like newspapers. Uh, um, filled with AI artic articles and some uh, fake news hidden so well that uh, people would think, oh, this looks good. And then they would find this one article that's really fake news and uh, take it for granted. Yeah. Um, I want to go I, back. I yeah. Go I, well, I wanted to go back to um, the Crossroads days. Mm -hmm. I'm bouncing back and forth. But uh, you were um, on the school newspaper. Can you tell us about that? Uh, I think the editor-in-chief at the time was JR. Um, mm -hmm. um, my role was not very prominent, but I liked being on the team. I think I didn't write much at the time, I don't think. But we met I think regularly. we'll find at least I, one. I, I, I'm going to... I think the one. technology was cool because we had some, I don't know uh, what they were called, but we, we could do professional layout uh, on, on a... Machine, or the computer. copy graphic machine. Yeah. They, they were right. something JR arranged for us to bring into the building. They were huge. And, right. um, but as huge as they were, they were very small. They had like a 40 character LCD screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. So you could. It was uh, really state of the art. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because as good as the Apple IIEs were, they, they weren't ready for layout or anything like, like that. But they could do Pac Man. Yes, they could. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, which reminds me, I've, I've asked uh, Daryl about this and others. Uh, you all spent a lot of time in the computer room, room six then, um, and seemingly had an enormous amount of fun. Um, is that a correct characterization? Yeah, I think there were others that were more into the technology than I was. But yeah, uh, I liked it there. Yeah. Pac-Man or, or other right. reasonable effects. Yeah. We didn't, I, I wasn't, I mean, there were others that really did programming and stuff like that. The early days of programming. And I didn't do much of that, but I liked writing on it. Excellent. And back to, to Lafayette Square. Um, does are, are there any similar neighborhoods in Germany? Mm, yes and no. I mean, there are uh, neighborhoods that were built in the late 19th century and uh, have spectacular architecture and, and are uh, and sort of uh, those brick buildings and stuff. Yes, we have that here too. But I've, when uh, I listened to the, the interview with Daryl and he was talking about safety here mm -hmm. and in Japan. He did. 
And um, I remember that time in St. Louis very vividly that um, my uh, Mary, my host mother, uh, usually when we drove somewhere, um, would say, lock your doors, because she was afraid of car napping, and which was a regular crime at the time. Um, mm-hmm. And she was concerned about our bus ride from Lafayette Square up to Delma, I think is where we uh, got out. So safety, I think, was a much bigger concern at that time in that area than it than I would see it anywhere here. And then that Daryl didn't see in Japan either. And and it has gotten better. Uh, yes, in the De Bolivar area now. Yeah. Um, it's uh, but it's still an uphill battle to try to convince more and more people that that is indeed the case. Um, well, is there anything I have not asked you about that you'd like to talk about? I think um, one thing is, I think the experience at Crossroads and in St. Louis. Um, changed my outlook on the world very much. I wanted to go out in the world. I mean, that's basically why I choose my profession. I didn't have a mission to convince uh, people of this or that. Um, I think it was basically a way to travel, Mm -hmm. to see the world. Yeah, And that's what I did. Um, And that's that, that basis for this kind of approach was dates back to 1981-82 when I spent a year in St. Louis. 